Hey guys, welcome to another EDH deck tech episode brought to you by the Command Valley. My name is Landon, and today I'll be breaking down my Naban Dean of Iteration deck. Before we dive into today's deck tech, I'd like to give a quick shout out to this channel's sponsor, GameGrid Lehigh, as well as give a huge shout out to all the patrons for this channel. We appreciate you guys a lot and your support is amazing. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. It's quick, easy, and free, and you will stay in the loop with all of our future deck techs that we release every Monday and our monthly gameplay series. We'll also have a link in the bio for our patron if you're interested in supporting the channel in a monetary way. All right, with that out of the way, let's dive into the deck. So like I said, today's episode is on Naban, Dean of Iteration. He is a legendary creature human wizard that costs one and a blue, and he reads, if a wizard entering the battlefield under your control causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. So we've seen effects like this before. The most common one is Panharmonicon that doubles all of your enter the battlefield triggers. Nibon really just cares about wizards, which I think is super cool. And I played a version of this on our very first gameplay video on our channel. And since then, I've actually done a couple variations. I revisited the deck list and I've made it a little bit better. Some new wizards have come out and I think the deck is so much fun to play. It's one of my favorite decks and I thought that maybe you guys would be interested in building it too. As it's pretty obvious what this deck is trying to do, we are wanting to get Nibon out as fast as possible and start playing wizards that have really powerful into the battlefield triggers or enter the battlefield triggers that draws cards or, or do something else. We want to play a lot of those because Nibon makes them twice as good. So to start off my list, I just wanted to go over the ramp because that's super important in every deck. So we're playing a bunch of mana rocks with Soul Ring, Cold Steel Heart, Everflowing Chalice, Mind Stone, Prismatic Lens, Sky Diamond, Thran Dynamo, Star Compass, Wayfarer's Bauble, and Sapphire Medallion. So basically, all of these artifacts cost two or less. They give us one to two mana each. In addition to playing mana rocks, we also have some ways of doubling our mana or reducing the cost of some of our spells. So Stony Brook Banneret is a super cool wizard. This little merfolk makes all of our other wizards cost one less to play. And we're also playing Cage Sun, which when it enters the battlefield, we choose a color. And whenever we tap our lands for that color of mana, we add double that mana instead. So it makes all of our islands tap for two mana. And then High Tide is one of my pet blue cards. I am playing a lot of pet cards in this deck, so I'm going to be saying that a couple more times. But if I'm playing a mono blue deck, I am jamming High Tide for one blue mana until end of turn. All islands produce an additional blue. Super great. That can give us some super explosive turns. All right, so getting into the synergy of the deck, I've kind of separated the enter the battlefield triggers into a couple different categories. We've got... Wizards that when they enter the battlefield draw us a card or they bounce something or they give us some type of other utility. So I'm going to start out with the card drawing wizards. All right, starting us off, we have Champion of Wits, which when it enters the battlefield, we draw cards equal to its power and then we discard two cards. So with Nabana, when this enters the battlefield, we're going to draw four cards and discard two. We can also eternalize it later from our graveyard by paying five blue blue and it comes back as a four four. So we'll be drawing eight cards and only having to discard two if we have Nabana. Otherwise, we're just going to be drawing four. Just so I don't have to repeat myself a lot saying we're going to double this with Naban out. Just bear in mind that all of these abilities are going to happen twice with Naban out, which makes otherwise not super efficient cards into much more efficient cards. Next up, we have Cloud Seer and Merchant of Secrets. They basically both do the same thing. When they enter the battlefield, they're going to draw us a card. We then have Pondering Mage, which when it enters the battlefield, we get to look at the top three cards of our library, put them back in any order. We can then shuffle our library if we don't like those three cards, and then we can draw a card. And then we're playing Gadwick the Wizened, which I really like this wizard. He's super cool. When he enters a battlefield, we draw X cards, and he does have X in his mana cost. And whenever we cast a blue spell, we can tap target non-land permanent and opponent controls, which is also super useful. We're going to be casting a lot of blue spells. So the interaction with him and Nabon is when Gadwick the Wizened enters a battlefield, Nabon will double the value of X. It's kind of weird the way they worded it, and I think they actually kind of had to change the rules a little so that it would work, but it does work we will draw double the cards so the next category of etbs that we have are other ways of getting cards into our hand they don't necessarily say draw or they want us to find a specific card so we have augur of bolus which when it enters a battlefield we can look at the top three cards of our library and put an instant or sorcery into our hand we do have some really powerful instants and we do have a combo that we'll go over later that this can help us set up we then have Seagate Orc, which when it enters the battlefield, we get to look at the top two cards of our library and put one into our hand and the other on the bottom. 
We then have Watcher for tomorrow, which it has a hideaway ability, which means when it enters a battlefield, we get to look at the top four cards of our library and exile one face down and put the rest on bottom. And then when Watcher for tomorrow leaves the battlefield, we can put the exiled card into our hand. And another thing about this deck is we have a bunch of different ways of bouncing our wizards back into our hand so we can replay them later in the game and get that enter the battlefield trigger again. So it's not unlikely for Watcher for tomorrow to get us, you know, four or five cards throughout a game. Really good card. We then have our Kaomancer, which when it enters the battlefield, we get to return an instant or sorcery from our graveyard to our hand. We are playing a lot of instants and sorceries, so this is as good as drawing. And then we have Omen Speaker and Fairy Seeker, each of which when they enter the battlefield let us scry. Scrying is a little bit weaker with Nabon's ability, so if maybe there are some other wizards that you like that have a more powerful enter the battlefield trigger, you can replace them here, but I like the scry ability. And finally, for our enter the battlefield category, we have the interaction. So the wizards that when they enter the battlefield, we can interact with permanents on the table. So we have Aether Adept and Exclusion Mage. They both basically do the same thing. When they enter the battlefield, we can return a creature to their owner's hands. Really flexible. We can either target a big creature on our opponent's side of the table, or we can bounce a wizard back to our hands to recycle their enter the battlefield ability. We then have Merfolk Trickster, which has flash. And when it enters the battlefield, we can tap target creature and opponent controls, and it loses all abilities until end of turn. Super cool card. It's a really gotcha card. As far as gotcha cards go, we have another one with Portal Mage, which also has flash. And when it enters a battlefield during the declare attacker step, we can reselect which player or planeswalker target a creature is attacking. Now, this one creature being able to redirect one creature to somebody else is pretty good, but really with Nabon, this is awesome. This can completely change an entire combat step for one of our opponents and can really change the tide of the game. This card is really cool. We then have Sower of Temptation, which when it enters a battlefield, we can gain control of target creature for as long as Sower of Temptation remains on the battlefield. So this is super cool too. We can use it a little bit politically because we do have many ways of bouncing our own creatures back to our hand. So maybe if we want to give our opponent the creature back that we stole so we can steal something else, that's a deal that we can make. And I think that's pretty cool. And then finally, we have Baron Tolarian Archmage, and he is a new legendary creature that came out in Core 21. And when he enters a battlefield, we can return up to one other target creature or planeswalker to its owner's hand. That's super cool. There aren't a lot of ways in blue of dealing with planeswalkers, so that's really nice. And at the beginning of our end step, if a permanent was put into our hand from the battlefield this turn, we can draw a card. So this will kind of turn into a card advantage engine throughout the game because we do have many ways of bouncing things back to our hand. So really powerful card in the deck. In addition to wizards with enter the battlefield abilities, we're also playing some other wizards that don't have enter the battlefield abilities, but have a lot of utility in the deck. So I'll show you what I mean. First up, we have a zombie lady of scrolls and she is bonkers in this deck. We can tap an untapped wizard we control to draw a card and she's a powerful commander on her own. In fact, I think that you could probably just switch Nabon for a zombie if you ever get bored of Nabon and the deck would still work pretty well. We then have Master of Waves, which is a really powerful card and could also be a win con. When he enters the battlefield, we create a number of 1-0 blue elemental creature tokens equal to our devotion to blue and the elemental creatures we control get plus one plus one and he has protection from red. So when he enters the battlefield, if we have Nibana, we're going to make twice as many of those elemental tokens and we have a ton of blue pips in our permanents and we're playing a lot of creatures which are permanents. So the, our devotion to blue, I've cast Master of Waves with a devotion to blue equal to seven or eight sometimes times and have made 16 illusions, that's enough to win the game. We then have Narumea, Master Wizard, and I want to pause on her just for a second to explain the combo that goes with her that we have in the deck. This is our another one of our win cons in addition to the Master of Waves. So Narumea has Flash, and when she enters a battlefield, we can copy target instant or sorcery spell that we control, and we can choose new targets for the copy. So a lot of people know this combo, it's pretty common. There are many cards that combo with her. I've only put one in the deck and that is Ghostly Flicker. But what Ghostly Flicker does is we can exile two target artifacts, creatures, and or lands we control and then we return those cards to the battlefield under our control. So what we do is we cast Ghostly Flicker, we hold priority stopping Ghostly Flicker from resolving and we cast Narumea because she has flash. She's going to enter the battlefield and we can target the Ghostly Flicker with her ability, which will put another copy of Ghostly Flicker on top of the stack, which will resolve first and we can target a land and Narumea. 
What that will do is that land will enter the battlefield untapped and Narumea will enter the battlefield and we can target the Ghosty Flicker on the bottom of the stack. We can do this infinite times because we can tap the land that we're blinking for mana and when it comes back in it's going to be untapped. So we can get infinite mana and then we can start blinking our wizards. Maybe one that draws us a card or maybe one that bounces one of our opponent's creatures and we can do this until all of our opponent's creatures are bounced or we have infinite mana. So once we've got infinite mana with Narumea and we've blinked one of our creatures into oblivion and we've drawn our entire library or bounced everything else on the table, we can simply cast a Thassa's Oracle to win the game. I know that Thassa's Oracle can get people a little bit salty and I understand that combos aren't for every playgroup. But you have to remember, wizards don't have the best stats when it comes to power and toughness. They don't hit that hard, and it's highly unlikely that you're going to be plowing everybody over with your, with your wizard. So we have to lean into that combo to win the game. All right, after that long explanation of Narumea, we have Riptide Director, which is a super cool wizard. It has an activated ability that costs two blue blue and tap, and then we draw a card for each wizard that we control. So it's not unlikely that we're drawing four or five cards off of this per turn. We then have Sigil Tracer, which is another one of my pet cards. I really like this wizard. She has an activated ability for one and a blue and tapping two untapped wizards we control. We can copy target instant or sorcery spell and choose new targets for the copy. Notice how this doesn't say copy target instant or sorcery spell that we control. We can target one of our opponents, maybe a tutor, maybe a kill spell, maybe a counter spell even, so we can counter their own counter spell with a copy of their own counter spell. There's a lot of really cool things that you can do and we're playing so many wizards and two mana is not a lot for this ability. I really like this card. And then we've got Vidalcan Aether Mage, which is a creature with flash, but really we're focusing on the ability Wizard Cycling. We can pay three mana and discard Vidalcan Aether Mage to search our library for any wizard and put it directly into our hand. And we can do it at instant speed, which is super cool. This can find us maybe a bounce creature that we need, an Archaeomancer to get something back from our graveyard, Master of Waves, or even Narumea if we're ready to combo off. And then finally we have Gale Caster Colossus. This massive wizard has a super powerful ability that says tap an untapped wizard you control and we can return target and on them permanent you don't control to its owner's hand. So with this out, things can get really difficult for our opponents to keep anything on the table. Okay, now that we've gone over all of the wizards in the deck, let's go over the other card draw spells, interaction, just the other cards in the deck. So starting off with the card draw, we've got Blue Sun Zenith and Pull From Tomorrow. Both of these are really good on their own if we're, you know, dumping five or six mana into them and our outlets once we get our infinite mana with Narumea. We're then playing Dig Through Time, which is kind of an expensive card. I think Drawn From Dreams is also really good. They basically do the same thing except for Dig Through Time has Delve and is instant speed. We get to look at the top seven cards of our library and put two of them into our hand. And then Factor Fiction, super great instant. We reveal the top five cards of our library and an opponent separates those cards into two piles. One goes into our hand and the other goes into our graveyard. We then have Impulse, which at instant speed, we can look at the top four cards of our library, put one of them into our hand and the rest go on the bottom. We're then playing some minor cantrips with Opt, Telling Time, and Brainstorm. And then we do have one tutor with Merchant Scroll. This can find us a blue instant from our library and we can put it into our hand. So this can find us our Ghostly Flicker. This can find us High Tide if we need the mana. This can find us, you know, a counter spell if we need it. And speaking of counter spells, let's go over the interaction. So we're playing the good old tried and true counter spell, and we're playing Familiar's Ruse, which is a counter spell, but and it's an additional cost, we have to return a creature to our hand, which is not a big downside, given that we want to put, be putting wizards back into our hand so we can redeploy them and get their ETB again. We're then playing Negate and Wizard's Retort, which we're going to have a wizard out. This is essentially another counter spell. Next up, let's go over the ways we have of dealing with our opponent's creatures. So we've got Reality Shift and Rapid Hybridization, just spot removal, getting rid of a creature. Reality Shift will exile them, Rapid Hybridization turns them into a 3-3. And then we have Domineering Will, which says target player gains control of up to three target non-attacking creatures until end of turn. Untap those creatures, they block this turn if able. So this can really change the tide of an attack of a combat step on one of our opponents. If we're getting attacked by some creatures on our, from our opponents, if we play it right, we could maybe get rid of six creatures if we make trades three for three. So that's a super cool card. We then have Blatant Thievery, which for each opponent, we gain control of target permanent that players control. It is a super expensive spell. And if we can copy it, that is super powerful. 
We then have some minor board wipes with Aetherize, which we can return all attacking creatures to their owner's hands, and then River's Rebuke, which we can return all non-land permanents target player controls to their hands, so we can set somebody back to the Stone Age. All right, and for this next category, I've just kind of called this utility cards, cards that don't really fit into other categories or are just have extra synergy in the deck. The first one is Rite of Replication. It is a sorcery with a kicker of five, and we put a token onto the battlefield that's a copy of target creature. And if Rite of Replication was kicked, we put five of those tokens onto the battlefield instead. We then have Propaganda, which is an enchantment that says creatures can't attack you unless their controller pays two for each creature they control that's attacking you. Like I said earlier in the video, wizards don't have the best power and toughness, and a lot of times the, the blocks that we'll make with the wizards will end up killing our wizards, and they're probably not going to kill the creature they're blocking, and if the creature has trample, it's just bad for us, so Propaganda kind of mitigates against that. We're then playing Chaos Wand, which is another one of my pet cards. If you have another card that you like more than Chaos Wand, feel free to sub substitute this in. I love this card. I think it's hilarious. And I one time won a draft with it. And ever since then, like it's, it's one of my favorite artifacts and it costs three and it has an activated ability that says pay four and tap and target opponent exiles cards from the top of their library until they exile an instant or sorcery card. And you can cast that card without paying its mana cost. And then you put the exiled cards that weren't cast this way on the bottom of that library in a random order. So you never know what you're going to get. You could hit a board wipe. You could hit a counter spell. You could hit a draw spell. It's, I love the mystery of it. And it's a super fun card. We're then playing Crystal Shard, which is really good in the deck. And this is one of the cards I was alluding to earlier about returning things to our hands. So it has an activated ability that says pay three and tap or one blue mana and tap. And we can return target creature to its owner's hand unless its controller pays one. So ideally we're going to want to be bouncing our own wizards back to our hand on an opponent's end step before our turn so we can redeploy that creature. We can also use it to bounce an opponent's creature if they're tapped out and they didn't see it coming, but really it's here to return the wizards to our hand. We then have Panharmonicon, which I mentioned earlier in the video. This is just an extra version of Nabon, and if we can get both Panharmonicon and Nabon on the table, that is Christmas land dream game. So Panharmonicon reads, if an artifact or creature entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. So it basically says the same thing except for it doesn't say wizard, but in our deck, we're really only playing wizards with ETBs. So this is super powerful with Nabon. And it's also just super powerful in general. And then finally, we are playing Lightning Greaves. It's just some extra insurance to make sure Nabon doesn't get removed. He ha will have haste and shroud and it can equip for zero. Super good card in the deck. All right, so we've gone over the non-land cards. Let's go over the mana base really quickly. It's super simple mana base. We're playing 32 islands, an emergent zone, and a mystic sanctuary. Emergent zone, we can sacrifice it to cast spells at instant speed until the end of turn, which could be super useful. And mystic sanctuary, when it enters a battlefield, we can put an instant or sorcery from our graveyard back on top of our library. I like it, super good card, and it is still an island, so high tide will still give us double mana off of it. And that is my Nabon Dean of Iteration deck. Thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode. We really appreciate it. Let me know down in the comments if there are any wizards that you've put in your Nabon Dean of Iteration deck or maybe just some of your pet cards. I talked about a lot of my pet cards and maybe you didn't know about some of them. So I'd like to hear about your pet cards so I can learn about new cards. If you guys have any suggestions for future decks that you'd like, uh, like to see us build, because there are so many legendary creatures that kind of fall through the cracks, and we spend a lot of time building decks around new legendary creatures that are coming out so we can stay up to date on all the hot stuff. And so if you maybe have a deck that you want us to build, let us know in the comments and we'll try our best to get to it. Just one more quick reminder, if you like this episode and you want to see future deck decks and gameplay videos, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on those. Thank you guys so much and have a great week.